Welcome to this webinar. It's a real pleasure to have everybody here to launch our new book, A New Focus on the British Empire. And it's a real pleasure to have my whole author team. If I'm being really honest, this is the first time the whole author team has been together as one group. So it's actually really exciting to have everybody here. The next 45 minutes uh, is going to be an informal chat, an informal discussion about the teaching of the British Empire. Um, and I wanted to kick things off with introducing everybody. First off, to introduce myself, my name's Rich Kennett. Um, I'm a history teacher here in Bristol, uh, and I write textbooks as a hobby, and I love doing so. Uh, but I want to hear from the rest of my team. Tom, start us off. Hello, I'm Tom Allen. Um, I'm a history teacher currently based in Germany, in Munich, but also really from Bristol as well. Um, I was a, uh, an author and one of the editors on the book, and I worked on sections on early America, violence in the First World War, as well as editing some of the other sections too. Um, hi, I'm Salma Barra. I am a history teacher in North London, and I'm also doing a master's in Black British history at Goldsmiths in London. Um, and I contributed to the textbook. I wrote a little bit about the Caribbean in the 19th century, and I've done a chapter about China and some other little bits about the Caribbean. Hi, uh, my name's Ed Durbin. I am a history teacher in South Gloucestershire, um, and uh, I authored some parts of the book on uh, the Second World War um, and the legacy, legacy to the British Empire. Um, and uh, I also edited other bits um, and got told uh, a great deal from, from doing so. Hello, my name is David Hibbert, and I am a history teacher from Oxford. Um, and I was, this is my first textbook experience, it was a brilliant one, um, and I worked on the sections on 20th century Iraq and Palestine. Hi, um, I'm Ziva, a former history teacher, um, but I'm currently a doctoral student at the University of Oxford, where my work is focusing on um, the history curriculum and decolonising the history curriculum. Um, the chapters that I worked on were 1947, the partition of India, um, the Amritsar massacre, and I also co-authored the chapter on race. Hi, I'm Emmy. Um, I am a history teacher in Northumberland. Um, this is also my first textbook experience. Um, and I have authored the chapters on Ireland, the three chapters on Ireland in the book. Hi, I'm Maya Stevenson. I'm a history teacher in Bristol and I authored the chapters on New Zealand and Australia. Hi, I'm Fumi. I am an anti-racism lead and history teacher in Bradford, and I wrote the chapters on the colonisation of Africa. Hi, I'm Sally, and I'm also a history teacher in Bristol, and I wrote the section on the early um, Caribbean, British Empire in the Caribbean, and uh, the, the some of the impact uh, that the British Empire had on Britain. Sections. And look, it is here. It is here. <laughs> And hi, I'm Shanaz. I'm also a history teacher. Uh, I work in central London and I wrote the sections on uh, the Indian subcontinent in the 19th century. Thank you, everybody. So this is how this is going to work for the next 40 minutes. Uh, we're going to really talk around uh, three big questions uh, this afternoon, three big questions that we think are really important that you have kind of an understanding of. Um, each of the team are going to chip in on some of those questions. We're not all going to talk about each one because otherwise we would be here all night because there are 11 of us. But we're going to kind of chip in on each of those three questions. And the three questions we're going to look at this afternoon are why is empire such an important topic for students to learn? What are the problems that we see as the current approaches to the teaching of the British Empire? And the third question is, what are the solutions uh, to some of those current approaches? So I want to start off, and each of those is going to be about 10, 15 minutes. And then at the end, we'll happily take anyone's questions if people have got more. So let's kick things off, uh, if that's OK, team. Can we talk about why is the empire such an important topic for students to learn, please? Um, Sal, can I start with you, if that's OK? So can you talk? So why do you so why do you think that top why that topic why this topic why is it that we kind of launched into this what has been now a two year project to kind of write about the British Empire? 
So I think part of the issue, where I, I've started teaching British Empire at A level, an early British Empire unit at A level this year, and it's really brought home to me like why we started this project in the first place, which is that it is fairly absent when it is taught in the curriculum. It's taught in a people, you know, it's definitely taught. People do teach it, but they, you know, there, there is a real um, dearth of resources. So there's not very much out there that you can draw on to teach that. Um, and th what, what that means is that you end up with people that know, oh, this is a really important topic to teach. I need to teach it. Um, but, but people are pulling resources from lots of different places. And so there's no kind of um, consistency in, the, in, in what people are, um, are getting. And this is where you end up with people that, you know, I, I, I never studied the British Empire when I was at university. So you end up with people that are, are not really specialists in that topic. And they're drawing on materials that maybe weren't, weren't created by specialists either. Um, the thing that, that I always um, come back to with the British Empire is, is this course. I've got this old, this big old textbook here, which is an old social and economic um, textbook um, from the old social and economic GCSE. So I've got a few of these because I like to collect old textbooks. And I, when I was trying to find materials for teaching my A-level, I was like, excellent. British history, 1700 to 1900. Economic history is going to be full of British Empire stuff. There is nothing. There is nothing in there. There's not. It's not even mentioned in here. Um, in this one, it's mentioned in a, in a kind of roundabout way. And I've also found this when I've been teaching modern British, um, a modern British unit for the A level, which is for OCR. There's a lot of economic history in there, and there's just you know the materials that I've got no mention of decolonization in there at all. And I just I've, I feel like I've got to the point with it now where you know obviously I'm not throwing shade at any past textbook authors here because we all know that as textbook authors that the page limits are brutal and we have to make sure that we just put in um, what we what what is needed. Um, but but. But it does feel a bit willful. This this ignoring of the impacts that the empire had in Britain feels a bit uh, feels a bit awkward now. So I think it's really important that we now get some empire in at um, uh, key stage three, and that it's done in a way kind of up to date scholarship, looking at what historians are saying. Um, and that's why I think our book is is obviously excellent. It'll be really useful. Um, shall I hand over to uh, Salma? Salma? Yeah. I mean, I think this actually like lots of food for thought. And I think one of the things is for the kind of absence of resources that we have often and that we've encountered in schools. And I know it's something we've talked about as a team is the sense actually for me that it is everywhere around us and around students in this country. And I think one of the things that is particularly kind of um, prominent to me in thinking about the British empire is this idea that we encounter it in so many spheres around us. We talk about that. We see it in public discussion. We see it in public debate. Um, we see it in conversations about money in Britain, about its legacy is present in conversations about museums, about migration in the politics of multiculture and, you know, any kind of co um, conversation about British multiculturalism, even, you know, British exceptionalism as an idea, the idea of or, or coming into Brexit. I think one of the things for me is that it's almost absent because it's so present. And I think one of the things that we're needing to do, and one of the reasons I think the question's a really good one is thinking about why schools in particular have a role to play is because we can equip students to navigate some of these themes and questions and legacies um, in an informed way and in a critical way that doesn't slide into generalization um, that might help sort of guard against, um, yeah. Uh, I think generalization is the big thing, but also against normalizing it as something that was just a thing that happened that was benevolent, that was somehow inevitable and benign, and then that went away. Um, and I think, yeah, in many ways, it feels very present to me. And I think that's why it's really important um, that we can address then what is actually a really complicated history, if not in all of its depth to students, but begin to flesh some of that out and begin to kind of think, well, how does a company start acquiring land for, for a state? How does that shape, particularly for a lot of us and a lot of our students, you know, the, the environments that we are in now? I think that's a really kind of key thing for me about why this is so important to explicitly address in schools and not just bumping into it in other contexts. That, that, that idea of present, sorry, I'm going to chip in if that's what I tell me. That idea of present, I think, is so key, though. Like, and the project's really made me reflect on that in the last two years. My walk to work, just I think about my own walk to work. I walked down Guinea Street in Bristol, named after the trade. 
I, I walk past buildings in the middle of town that have been used that are there because they were trading uh, with the colonies. I, I walk past the SS Great Britain that was there taking people migrating to Australia. It it, it, it literally is everywhere. But I can't. We we've talked a lot in this group about the fact that textbooks that we were brought up with at school was completely absent uh, completely absent uh emmy i wanted you to chip in on this first question as well because i think you've got kind of a really interesting take on it that i think is worthwhile here everybody hearing and um, I, I agree with everything that you guys have said and uh, i think that presence thing is really important i always think of that quote from satnam sangera we're here because you were there and I think for our students, like it's it's understanding the world that they live in today. I know it sounds so cliched for a history teacher that oh we we teach them history so they understand their present the present today, but it is actually true. And I think for empire, it is very, very true. Thinking about the makeup of, um, you know, of Britain um, and who's living here and, and where everybody has come from. And it's to get students to understand, and particularly with all the migration debates, especially that are going on, that, you know, migration isn't new for a start. And um, that a lot of the people who are here are, own, are in Britain because Britain was in their country and um, because of the colonies. Um, and I think it just explains so much in our society and it is so present as you kept saying Salma it is constantly present there's so many debates around it at the moment um like I don't know if, it, if, if people have seen the Guardian this week about you know their links to slavery and people are confronting lots of their sort of empire links and um I just think it's so important for students to understand that and from my point of view from being from Northern Ireland, which some people would say is still a colony, some people would argue is completely part of Great Britain. I think for um, for people to understand particularly what's going on in Northern Ireland is in the news all the time now, you've got to understand the British Empire and you've also got to understand that long history as well, because I also think in schools we, we bring in the British Empire kind of like the 19th century, we're like, oh, there was an empire, but actually we've got to be thinking way, way further back than that. Um, and so from, from my point of view, 1171 is the key date um, for other countries obviously it's a lot later but I think it's really important that we give students that background that this isn't something that just happened in the 19th century that it was a process that went on for a really really long time so that's my two cents I completely agree and I think that that to me again that's one of those things I think has really come out of this project that idea of the long history of empire that I, I completely like it, it's too often that it's just 19th century and I think we need to expand that both forward and back and um, anybody want to chip in on that first question about kind of why they think it's so important though anybody else Shanaz yeah I completely echo what everyone said in terms of the moral purpose of teaching it and for uh, understanding prevalent issues today um, but also I think it's just it's bad history if we don't teach it to our students like I'm just astounded Sally that there's a textbook about British economic history in the 18th century and it doesn't even mention the empire that's just so unrepresentative and we're just teaching really terrible history um if we don't teach it properly that is such a blooming good point uh yeah anybody want to chip on that first question anybody else good I think they, to be honest, I think that did cover all those major points, really. That so, why why do we think empire is so important? And um, definitely that idea of uh, it informing our present. That idea that actually this has been a neglected topic in schools for so long. And I love Shanaz's point about this being bad history if we don't do it. I hugely agree. Now I think we've kind of touched on some of those points that we're probably going to go into in this second question. Um, but I really want to kind of now really focus in on. Um, which we've talked a lot about in this group. We've got a WhatsApp chat. We've been talking about this for a long time now. Um, what do we kind of see as those problems of the current approaches um, to teaching of empire? And if you don't mind, fund me, can I go to you first, if that's OK? Yeah, that's fine. Um, I think, well, we all agree that it's really problematic that so much of the teaching of empire is based on the perspective of the colonizers rather than the colonized, hence the book, um, which is questionable. And for example, most teachers would agree that we wouldn't teach about women's suffrage without considering the experiences of women and without paying tribute to the significant role of women within that movement. And so it's really problematic that much of the teaching surrounding empire is taught through the lens of white European colonists rather than being based on the experiences of the colonized. 
And I think that's especially problematic when you consider that such a significant proportion of students across UK schools are from ethnic minority backgrounds, because if you think about this idea that a lot of their families are likely to be first or second gen generation immigrants with their own familiar links to stories of empire and decolonization. If we ignore the perspectives of the colonized, we're just contributing to this kind of disillusionment that people have with the education system, because if students are continuously exposed to this disconnect between their own family histories and what's taught in school, it, it's gonna be problematic for them in terms of their learning as well. Very good and very well put. Uh, Ed. Yeah, and, and just to build on that as well, I think like even just like if you think about the, the imagery that students get of empire, and I, I've definitely been guilty of this in my teaching, and this is something that Tom's talked a lot about and it's been great. I think it's been really useful in the book to think about this. It's like so much of the imagery that students get is from a colonizer's point of view. Like that that students are not seeing the Maroons as the Maroons would want to see them. They're not seeing uh see themselves, they're not seeing the, the Maori as the Maori represent themselves. They're seeing on the slides and in traditional textbooks, um, like colonizers representations of, the, of those things and just so that the, our students imaginary the way they imagine the world and the empire is if we're not careful from a colonized point of view um so i so i, I think that point about the colonizers and the colonizers is so important um the thing i wanted to touch on was just like the the the, the challenge i think of teaching the empire which is that the the immense like chronological breadth that emmy's talked about we can start in the 12th century or that like, we might start you might start in the 15th century with uh, Giovanni Caboto, um, and then it's an ongoing process, like it's definitely not over. One of the things we talk about in the book is the, the story of the Chagos Islanders and the ongoing struggle for um, Chagossian independence. Um, and then it's a ge geographical spread, like we're talking about um, the world from Newfoundland to New Zealand and stopping off in Myanmar and Kenya and the Caribbean. Uh, so there's a huge there's a huge geographical spread and often I think in 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 schools and in ways that this presume this has been presented before we're doing this in like one inquiry or a one-off topic in year eight and that I don't think you would do that for any other topic you wouldn't cover 500 years of world history in like one in one topic and expect that that teaching to do justice to it and I think we have to recognize there's a challenge there but also think about how we might overcome that and thinking about how we um potentially like mix depth and breadth, which is something we try to do in the book, uh, in, in our teaching, and also to try and imperialize other topics that we teach so that we're not necessarily teaching empire as like a discrete, discrete topic, but we're thinking how we might imperialize our teaching of the 16th and 17th century, for example, and how we might imperialize the teaching of the, the world wars, for example, in, 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 the, in the 20th century. So I think there are, there are some, some challenges there and some problems with existing teaching that teaches empire as discrete from everything else, um, when as People have you mentioned rich for example just with your walk to work how 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 much the empire is part of our the world that surrounds us that that point i think about 500 year history is key to me as well and the, and, and that idea about doing 500 years in a single topic it, it is mad but i think is the practice in a lot of schools and i think I, we, we hope that the book might help to challenge some of that um david yeah, I just want to build really on what, on what Ed was saying about the challenge of the breadth and the nature of the history. Um, and I guess kind of looking at it from a slightly different lens, if we're thinking about it from a curriculum planning point of view, the decisions that we might make around second order concepts and the way that sort of intersects with the history that we're teaching and also maybe some of the moral imperatives and some of the desire to, to kind of do justice to the history in the ways that we've already said. Because if we consider the British Empire or parts of the British Empire across a curriculum through the lens of consequences, um, then that that kind of illuminates certain parts of it and obscures others. Sim same thing for similarity and difference, change and continuity causation. And if we're thinking about the problems with current approaches to the teaching of the British Empire, I think causation is a really interesting case study in that lots of people ask the question, how, did the, how was the British Empire created? Which is, I guess, not in itself a bad question, but then by virtue of what it obscures it means that you're then perhaps not focusing on other things and that speaks to what ed was saying and i know what we've talked about before about the need to both spread that out across the curriculum as well as imperializing other topics so you get that breadth but i think that is a a real challenge is how we consider the interrelationship with empire across a whole curriculum with the different conceptual options the lenses the the sequences that we can use to to kind of bring a picture of what 
of what that topic means for our students across the curriculum. And I think that's a really profound challenge and a, re a, a massively complex one. Um, and I, if I think about my, my feelings about planning and teaching this topic, I, for a long time, I felt that it was very, very important, but I didn't feel that I felt like I had the tools either resource wise or almost just like intellectually to do justice to it. And I think so I, there was simultaneously this desire to teach it, but then this sense that I didn't really know how to teach it well. And hopefully there's that, this conversation and the book can help equip teachers with some of the tools to help them navigate that and help them feel secure in, in doing so. I, I could not agree more as well that I, that I felt the exact same. And I think your point, David, about causation questions this group's talked a lot about that that i think causation questions when it comes to empire are actually quite problematic and that links back to what Fummy was saying about it, you you do a cause question you pretty much have to nearly always look at it through the eyes of european colonizers you do a consequences question it flips it but i think the majority of schools and the majority of history teachers I talk to still do causes questions for empire. I mean, Sal and I talk about this a lot, that history teachers are weirdly obsessed with cause questions. And I think we need to kind of break free of that. Like cause questions are great, but there are there are other questions. And, and I think with empire in particular, those other questions are fundamental. Um, Zeba, what about other problems with current approaches? So I think quite a lot of what I was thinking has already been said, but I think I just want to add to some of the things that we're talking about in terms of representation. So we've got to be really careful about where we start the story, I guess. Um, and I think there's this tendency to begin the story with um, the British getting there and then, then that area becomes important. And I think we made a really conscious effort in the book to make sure that we aren't beginning this, the story with the colonisers. We are starting with those places as, as having value beyond European interest in them. And I think that that is really important. Um, also, I think we in touching, I continue with that idea of the issue of representation. I think there's a tendency to kind of focus on big man history and thinking about the empire in terms of big political decisions that have been made. But then my worry with that is that it doesn't feel very real for the young people. I mean, if we're just acting as though the empire happened in a room where men sat together and made decisions, I think it's really important to kind of tell the history from below and think about the impacts and the experiences um, of the people who kind of who who were colonised and, and kind of what that felt like. And I feel like that makes it a lot more real and it touches on lots of what people have said already about you want to make the empire have meaning for young people, because otherwise, then what, what's the point of them doing it? We want them to see how this impacted the experiences of people, why it was significant to people's lives. Um, and I think I think that's really important. I think something that hasn't been said, but I think is also kind of really present in conversations that history students have about this is the balance sheet approach and I think we made a really very conscious decision um, to move beyond the balance sheet here to create this more nuanced um, view of empire because I mean as if you can I, I can understand kind of where it comes from kind of thinking about well we want to make sure that we show a fair view of empire but as if you can have in one column you know, um, mass genocide, and then in the other column, you can compare that with, well, we gave them railroads. Of course, that's a ridiculous kind of comparison to make. So we've made a we've, we've made a really conscious effort to add nuance to the teaching of empire and have that kind of understanding of, of it in, in lots of different ways and not just kind of a balance sheet approach. So that's a, a key thing for me. That balance sheet approach um, and critiquing it is something we've talked about a lot. and. This is why I like working with this group. Ed, Ed came up with this phrase to me, and it was like an, Ed's an annoyingly clever person, by the way, if you don't know Ed. And Ed, Ed said to me, the balance sheet approach is a moral question, not a historical question. And every time now I think about balance sheet approach, I'm like, no, it's a moral question, not a historical question. And I think we should be asking the historical questions in the history classroom. And I think that that to me, it was suddenly like opened up my mind to thinking about it in different ways. And um, the other thing we've not talked about yet, and I really want someone to chip in on is I think one of those current approaches or the problems with current approaches that we've talked about a lot um, is the neglect of race as an issue um, in the teaching of British Empire. And I was wondering if somebody else would chip in on this, please. I'll pick yeah, something. I'm happy to to discuss that because that's one of the chapters that um, I contributed to as well. 
Um, but I think there's this fear about approaching the topic of race because it's it's so huge and it's so controversial. Um, but I think it's absolutely central um, in order to help young people understand kind of the situation, the way the, the world is today um, and how, you know, concepts like race, we, we've got to problematize them so that kids don't think that they are just a given. Right. And I think that's really important. We need to be explicitly discussing race with young people and how race kind of it develops as a concept so that young people can understand that the world doesn't have to be kind of the way that it is today. That things like, um, you know, the enslavement of, of, of black people, it's not inevitable. It's something that has been created. It's constructed. Race is a construct. And I think that that's really central. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, I think that was the thing that sort of occurred to me as well. And I think one of the things that's really important about prefacing that like race is something that is constructed and can be historicized is this idea that it does then again, coming back to this idea of Britishness and modern legacies and things like that, it does shape how people identify with Britishness and how Britishness is constructed at different times. And I think we've kind of touched upon this, but if we do expand the lens of empire, you start asking questions about Englishness turning into Britishness and who identifies as Britishness at different points and I think this process and you know doing work towards my MA has really made me think a lot about when people acquire and are prepared to identify with Britishness and the context in which it's used and I think that's part of the discomfort around it is it's comfortable to kind of identify with a neatly positive version of Britishness and disengage from a lot of the kind of more complicated issues around race, et cetera. But I, I think it's something that does have a bearing on ideas about inclusion, exclusion, Britishness, and means it needs to be foregrounded in a really like careful way. Fun me, sorry. You are mute. <laughs> Again. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I think people need to kind of realize that teaching about empire is a really useful way of kind of challenging racial stereotypes and lots of the arguments that people use to kind of continue the system of racism today. So I think a lot of racism is grounded in this idea that people are inferior um, and kind of that's one of the arguments that people put forward a lot. And like Xavier mentioned earlier, if we are focusing on those stories of different countries prior to colonization, it's a really, really fundamental challenge to that idea that certain communities and certain groups are inferior because actually it's like, look at what these people contributed prior to European influence, look at kind of the systems that they had and the amazing kind of cultures that had developed before. And so giving students that understanding really challenges some of those notions that they might be seeing online or in the media and um, that suggests that certain groups are inferior based on race as well. Tom. Yeah I just wanted to jump in as well uh, on, on the race uh, aspect of the book to say a lot of schools do, do, do teach about race in history but they'll probably be doing it about somewhere else like America, South Africa, and I think bringing race into the story of empire is a really important way of, of tying those things together, firstly, but also um, showing that racism isn't just something that happened in other parts of the world. Um, I mean, we deliberately put into this empire book a section on the beginnings of the United States and uh, the American Revolution, and we wanted to tell that story through the continuities from British rule in terms of uh, of race, as opposed to the Americans doing something completely different when when they became their own country. So um, yeah, I think it's it's something that can that can bring that story home and uh, and and problematize it probably for the teachers and for the students, but but show how complex it is. Ed. Um, I just want to, to just link this discussion back to something that Fumi said at the, at the beginning, which is that obviously there's, when with the inclusion of, uh, like in the book, we talk a lot about race and there's a, there's a, a section, a short section on um, uh, on race and the empire. And obviously that's got like a like an, an element of like teaching kids about the world they live in today, but also like the story of the empire doesn't make sense without it. Like you're, you're, um, you're teaching bad history if, you're, if you think you can teach the history of the British empire without teaching about race like how are students going to get from millions of uh, millions of uh, Indians and Africans fighting for Britain in, in, in the world wars and then coming out of those, those 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 situations wanting independence like how are they going to make sense of that, of that of that story if they don't understand how the experience of the people 
going through those situations. So I think there's the tendency, is like, just to zoom out a bit, like people, when people think about history teachers teaching about the empire and race, they think we're just like teaching all the kids that Churchill was a racist and then we're going to go home. Um, but like, actually, you can't understand the actions of those people without understanding um, race and racism. And the, the story doesn't make sense without it. So I think that's, it, it justifies its inclusion just on, on a, from a purely like historical perspective. Shinaz. You're on mute, my friend. It's not just me. That makes me feel better. I did it on purpose. Um, yeah, so just to build on what Ed said is, uh, yeah, so race was is just crucial to the story of empire in how the British justified um, what they did. Um, also how they ruled the administrative uh, legal systems um, in the different colonies. Um, so it's, it's crucial to the story of empire, how it worked, why it worked the way it did. Um, so yeah, yeah it's, it's really important. And I think it's great that we've confronted it really overtly and directly in the textbook. Thank you very much. So I think we talked quite a lot about the problems. We've talked about the importance, um, less officers solutions. Let's try and end on a positive. Um, so can we think about team, can we think about what do we think are the solutions to some of those current problems? So we talked a lot about the problems in the last 20 minutes, which is great. Um, what do we think are the solutions? How can we teach British Empire better? What do we think are the secret ingredients to kind of making this a better history? Um, Maya, do you mind if I start with you, please, boss? You're, now you're an omni. Good. No, fine. Uh, I think this, I'm on. Two things that uh, we think when we was having um, narratives from the perspective of colonized people, so like individual stories that like dramatize the complexity of empire, but also make sure it's from the perspective of the people who were colonized rather than from the perspective of the colonizers. So like in the chapters I did, we looked at people like Triganini and Honaheke in Aus uh, Australia and New Zealand, and going into a bit of depth on those stories lets you show that the empire is a empire is a story that happens about real people like real individuals with actual names and not just like statistics or huge groups who you can't like who it's difficult to like empathize with or understand as people that things happen to um, and it also helps you see like that the empire was really complex so with like Triganini in Tasmania her family were um her family were victims of really violent early white early settlement by whalers but later in her life she ended up helping the colonizers remove the last tasmanian people from tasmania and that story is really complex because she really suffered uh from the colonization but she was able to use the colonization to kind of live the life she wanted not wanted but to live a life more similar to her previous life by helping to colonize the rest of Tasmania. And like stories like that help you see that it's not, it's a really complicated story. There's loads of nuance in it. And it's not just like clear cut, these people uh, had things done to them. They also acted um, with their own motivations. Um, and it's also about like reading scholarship. So um, reading about, colonization in Australia and New Zealand you can't really escape race and violence uh, and so those are two things that we thought were things that were left out if you read the actual scholarship it's there all the time um, like in New Zealand and Australia the way that the people were treated uh, was because of the British views of those different races like Maori were seen as noble warriors who the British were kind of intimidated by whereas Australian first people were seen as weak and the British kind of expected them to become extinct. And that like dictated how the British um, attempted to colonize those places. Um, and then there's violence throughout both of their stories, even if in the more popular imagination, like Australia was a more peaceful colonization, but actually the, his the history shows that there were, and the scholarship shows that like the frontier wars were incredibly violent um, and that that's something that Australia is like beginning to reckon with because like the first people's Australians are kind of forcing um, that reckoning and historians are like supporting that and showing that these things 
kind of actually happened. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think that that idea about individual stories is so key and you will notice when you read the book and I hope you do read the book and please do and um, everybody's chapters <laughs> well done so every well done Eddie. everybody's chapters have got uh, individual stories in because we think that that idea about nuance and complexity is the most important thing um Shinaz any other solutions please um yeah so I think it's uh, the way that the textbook is structured I think it really helps as well because um Ed spoke about the chronological and geographical breadth of empire and obviously you can't teach that um you can't teach it all it's impossible and so the textbook really allows you to just pick um one or two colonies um and really focus using those individuals that we've used to uh kind of to, to highlight the stories and that hopefully will you know make it less overwhelming and scary to history teachers um planning schemes of works on empire where they can you know the textbook just makes it really easy to choose um you know one one colony or even just one time period in a colony um and get a really great scheme of work where you're focusing on the colonized the perspective of the colonized through those stories um maya also mentioned uh the scholarship and i think what's really great about the textbook is how we've used um everything's been reviewed and then reviewed again by different historians um but also we as authors so you know we were engaging with the scholarship and then doing spotlights on historians and it's like there's, there's a section um one of my chapters is about the indian rebellion 1857 and there's a part on how the historiography of it has changed as empire changed so you know it's the story of the british so it was a mutiny and then uh indians began to reclaim it during the independence movement and repurposed it for their own uh ends so you know an independence war once the in in independence movement started and then after independence it's no uh, it's that, that story changes as well so i think that really helps to solve a lot of the issues with teaching empire i think that that point about Histor historians and using historians is key and i think even if you're not using our textbook and i really hope you do but if you're not um that idea of engaging with historians has made our work so much richer for all of us and all of us have worked with proper big name academics to kind of rigorously rip apart our work which has been great um tom any other nuggets of uh solutions please before we end well i think everything's been covered really well there but it's like that idea of um who are the main characters in this story um i think one of the books that really inspired when we were in the very early planning stages of this book uh one of the, the history books that was that really inspired the approach is this land is their land a, a book about the thanksgiving story the pilgrims in north america in the 17th century quite a familiar story probably to most people um but the main characters in that story, the way it's normally taught, the way it's normally told are the Pilgrim Fathers, the colonists who went over from, uh, from Plymouth. But uh, in this book, that, that narrative is flipped around and the Wampanoag Algonquian people, the story is told from their perspective and it's a completely different story for that. And that's, that's, that's the approach we wanted to take. Those individual people like Tisquantum, the uh, the Wampanoag man who had been enslaved by Spanish fishermen, taken to Spain, had lived in London, learnt English, made his way back to his home village only to find out everyone had died in an epidemic. And it's at that point in his life story that he decides to help these, um, these uh, colonists from England. Um, suddenly those decisions, those real life decisions, make a lot more sense. And um, and I think, as everyone else has said as well, that that really rich engagement with the scholarship, the historians who've been so generous with their time and their expertise. Um, and I think it's also as a as a team, we've we've taken the approach of being being open to criticism as well. It's uh, we've had a lot of a lot of feedback from historians, and sometimes you know they, we've had to change a lot of things in the book. Um, and 
I think that that's made it a much better book as a result. And uh, and this this won't be the last book on the British Empire. You know, there'll, there'll be other ones that will build on this and will will continue to tell the story. But uh, hopefully, it will spark a new way of doing things. Thank you very much. Um, we're really quite open now to answering anybody else's questions if they've got them. So if you want to put questions into the chat box, we really would quite happily stay around for another 10, 15 minutes and answer any questions you've got. Um, we had one over Twitter that I kind of wanted to start with. We've kind of touched on it already, but I wanted it's an important question. So uh, here we go. Sorry, I'm bringing it up on my phone. Apologies. Um, so the question is, how do you address race and racism, structural and otherwise, um, in teaching empire both historically and its continued reality and legacy in the present in the present so i'm going to repeat that because it's a long question it's an important one uh how do you address race and racism in teaching empire both historically and its continued reality and legacy in the present does anybody want to chip in i think we've kind of touched on it quite a bit already but um Shunaz, brilliant. Thank you. So I think you, I personally don't believe you can separate how it's uh, race um, in empire historically and what, how it exists today, because racism today, you know, the structural uh, institutional aspects of racism today are largely explained by, or, you know, they are because of, or because of empire and how race is, uh, was created during empire. Um, so, you know, if I look, look at the Indian subcontinent, when I'm teaching the Indian subcontinent, um, it's just ideas of racism and how certain groups in the Indian subcontinent were treated differently um, by the British, uh, like, for example, you know, Punjabis being seen as, you know, Sikhs and Punjab being seen as a martial race and, you know, give it be, being given a certain preference in military matters, etc. And that kind of helps explain um the the political situation in uh, india in that region um as well as the diaspora communities in um you know across the world including in the uk so i think by teaching race and how it's been created by the empire it helps to explain its place in terms of structural institutional racism today thank you anybody else zaber um, I think that's absolutely right, Shanaz, and I, I think I would just add to that, that there has to be spaces within your lessons to get the kids to think about what does that mean now for me today. Um, and I think it's really important to show the way in which race is constructed and how it changes. And I think through the chapter that, that we wrote on race, Rich, the, the, we kind of make clear um, that it changes, that there are differences and the construction of um, people of colour, but also the construction of whiteness um, is um, is something that kind of that has that, it, that changes kind of throughout history and it's really important then to allow kids to see that this isn't the way that it has to be and therefore there are ways to kind of move away from this as well and kind of what kind of a world do we want today then um, and I think it's really important to offer kids that space to critically reflect um, and reflect on the impact that that then has on them um, in the present as well. David and also apologies uh people that are watching we've realized that the chat isn't at the moment enabled we're trying to work on that apologies we thought it was sorry uh david yeah uh, first of all before i before I, I say this just a bit quick tribute to jason todd to who i owe most of what i'm about to say um and thank you i think his involvement in the book has also has also been really helpful but um, i just wanted to say uh i think going back to that point about personal stories about that idea of kind of of making it concrete in terms of what that looks like um, in in people's lives. And I just think of one example, the example of Norman Manley. This came in a project I did with Jason before this book. Um, a really fascinating person, um, was a Rhodes Scholar, fought in World War I, later became uh, the first premier of Jamaica. And he was of mixed race background. And I thought that in that project, what we did is we told the story and then thought about the manifestations of 19th century ideas of race in his life but also how he challenged those ideas and it has a way of kind of making abstractions concrete I think in, in the same way that people were talking about earlier. Thank you very much. 
Xavier. One more thing. I also want to add the fact that it's really important to show examples of people resisting the ideas of, of race as well, which, again, I think we've included in our book so that kids can see possibilities and that, you know, you are not always kind of constrained by the ideas of race. That there are and, and the ideas of race aren't kind of uh, we can't use that as an excuse to be like, well, everybody at that time was racist. Well, actually, here are some people that have resisted um, these racist ideas kind of as well. Thank you very much. Really good question over Twitter. Uh, great question from Jake. Uh, where do you fit a study of empire in chronologically? And do you typically teach it in one block? Anybody want to chip in? So where do you teach empire? And do you do it in one block from Jake? Emmy. No, I, I wouldn't do it in one block. I, I think it has to be taught throughout um, any British history teaching that we are doing certainly for the British Empire um, I, I think you know and I am biased and I do appreciate this that I, I think it should be in our sort of even our medieval topics it should be in there at least that even at this point in time uh, the English as it were are looking at other places and they are settling and, and colonizing and other places um, but I definitely don't think it should be restricted to just one, because again, that just makes it feel like it appears from nowhere. As I think if we are touching upon it constantly and referring back to it, um, it just makes more sense for when you do then hone in maybe on somewhere as a case study that um, students are already really aware of what it is and where it came from. Um, I, I certainly would not recommend doing it in just you know in one block i think it's got to be weaved in and threaded through we think about these you know golden threads in, in history i i really think that empire is a huge thread that we should be seeing through our, our curriculums um in not just in key stage three i mean i teach key stage two and we even have aspects of british empire in there so that they're already very familiar even when they come up to um to key stage three i completely agree with emmy uh salma um i was just gonna um, hark back also to something that Janelle said, I think, um, which is about like picking up, was it Janelle? Picking up like threads or picking up case studies and how we can make it more manageable. We can weave it in a slightly more kind of organic way throughout the curriculum, but by grounding this in particular locations, as long as we kind of alert students that we can't give them the complete picture, we can kind of explain, we can show the breadth and we can show the kind of duration by picking case studies. So certainly like in our curriculum at the moment, we really hone in on the Caribbean and on like the sub Asian the subcontinent kind of developments, pre-empires or pre-British presence moving through. And then at different points in the curriculum, it kind of connects up a little bit. I don't think there's a, necessarily a perfect way of doing it, but there are ways of spreading out. And it means that when we do something a little bit more explicitly about the British empire, when we do a kind of comparative, um, inquiry in the 19th century they're picking up threads that have already been set in earlier in the curriculum so that it's not kind of appearing magically out of nowhere or as a 19th century phenomenon we think we've worked out how to do this uh alex could you enable sound please for yeah. uh shannon carter i'm going to pick random names if that's okay shannon if you in what's your question We hope this will work. We can try someone else if you like, see if it works. Yeah, can we try can we try Jason then, please, Alex? Oh, hello. Sorry. Shannon, brilliant. Yeah, have you got questions? Sorry, I didn't, um yeah, I didn't know if I missed this at the start. Would you be able to confirm that the full title of the book? for me please i'm really sorry can you say that again i missed it yeah, oh, um, i'm not sure I... <laughs> i'm not sure if i missed this at the start of the talk but could you we are you able to confirm the full title of the book for me please it is a new focus on the british empire circa 1500 to the present thank you jason have you got a question for us if alex could you See if you could enable Jason to have some volume. We're not going to get through everybody, but we'll try. Um, sorry, just jump in. Yes, that's absolutely fine. I've enabled Jason, but I have now also enabled 
everyone's pop questions in the chat box as well. Hey, this is even better. Everybody else, if you wouldn't mind putting the questions into the chat box, that'd be great. But Jason, let's hear from you. Uh, hello, Richard. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Fantastic. I'm just wondering whether, um, whether you had any thoughts around how we might confront some of the controversies around um sort of historians who have challenged the way that we're approaching empire like um Olashuga and satnam sangira and um some of the hostility that they've faced as a result of that whether that's useful to explore in in lessons and how we might approach that kind of side of uh, the recent debates great question um I'm, i'll answer that if that's okay um i i think we need to be honest about it um, so I, I've done that recently in my class. So we, we, living in Bristol, it's difficult to avoid that debate. And we've actively talked about it in class. Um, and we've actively talked about it and we've shared kind of some of those articles. There's some great, and also the thing that's really good about that is there's some really good news articles on it. And news articles were always quite accessible. So there's some really nice accessible news articles that talk about that issue that kids can look apart and unpick. Um, and I think, to be honest, I think we should be. I, I do appreciate the culture wars, which obviously that is part of a, a sensitive topic, but I don't, if it's in the press, I think it's a good thing that we're talking about it because kids are going to find out about it otherwise. Great question. Um, oh, look, here we go. There's some more. I hope that answered your question as well. Uh, there's some more in the chat now, which is brilliant. Um, here we go. Let me see if I can find. I'm going to work this out. Uh, oh, nice question. Have you got any advice on where to start as a newly qualified teacher who's never taught or really studied the empire before? Um, it's a topic that I don't really feel confident with. So I'm nervous on getting it wrong. That is completely normal that you feel nervous about getting it wrong. Um, can I pick on somebody? Funnily, where would you where would you start if you were an NQT? I mean, um, you're not, but where would you start? <laughs> <laughs> I guess because it's a pretty positive time at the moment, I guess, because there is so much kind of literature coming out around this topic and there are all sorts of webinars and things like that. I guess kind of, I mean, you've got loads of names of experts in this now webinar as well. So kind of engage with the things that people within this sphere have published, engage with it. Like if you join Twitter, for example, I know Twitter is sometimes a terrible place, um, but also it can be an excellent place in terms of people sharing resources, because there are a lot of people really passionate about this topic who can give advice in terms of what they've done in school and how they've supported new teachers in terms of teaching these topics. Um, I think going into it as much reading as you can really I know that everybody's pushed to time push for time but I think as much reading that you can do around the topic is incredibly important because what you don't want to do is kind of apart from this book you could use this for a book and just run with it that's fine but you don't want to just um, find one resource on the internet and kind of stick with that in case there are some kind of troubling things in there so yeah I guess kind of reading and leaning on people's expertise is where I would start as an NQT. Great advice wholly agree twitter can be horrible but it can also be brilliant it's why i've met the majority of you tom are you recommending a book yeah there's another book here this is philippa levine's book the british empire sunrise to sunset really good which uh yeah is kind of aimed at undergraduate students and it just got short chapters on each part of the empire with further reading at the end really recommend that there so is a question here that i kind of love uh, that i want to address uh, and because I think it's really awkward and I like it. Uh, how would you suggest teaching empire for what it is without undermining British values? It's important that students don't go away feeling hatred uh, towards the country. It's more so the actions of individuals that should be condemned. That's a really interesting question. So uh, how do you suggest teaching empire for what it is without undermining British values? Uh, Emmy. This is something I've been very actively worried about and got in my own head when I was teaching it. And, and one of the things that I always say to students is, I'm like, this is not you. You weren't part of this. This is something that has happened in the past. You are not taking responsibility for this um, and ma making it very clear that we don't say we, I don't say, you know, we as Britain did this. Um, I very much keep it as this happened in the past. This was decisions that were made by people in the past. We might look at it differently today and it's getting them to 
not almost feel of anything for the empire in that respect, that there isn't this sense of huge pride. And obviously people will feel sort of, they will feel sad about it, they will feel shame, but it's trying not to put that on them and trying to make sure that they don't go away feeling like this is something that they are in any way responsible for um, and have any hatred for it. And that, that's what I always try to do. I actively avoid ever saying we, if I talk about Britain to kind of keep it almost at that distance while still teaching it as it is very good bit of advice ed um yeah i was going to say something very similar to, to to emmy i think like part of our part of our job as history teachers is to and i i don't think we're going to be we're not going to be amoral about what happens in the past right we, we know what we we're not kind of taking a complete neutral position but like the like i think that word condemn in the question is quite um it's like we're not really in the business of condemning individuals or condemning nations or, or anything like that we're trying to help our students understand the past and that's where the balance sheet is not a good approach because we're not trying to like put people in in the dock and say like oh you did this wrong or you did that right we're trying to understand why things happen the consequences of things because that's what history teaching is and i think if we stay to that that disciplinary focus that's really important and i just add one other thing to that like i i think sometimes in our in our teaching and our debates about empire we get we we sometimes it's a good thing to get to get really engaged in the current debate in britain about the british empire um but um our students are going to be growing up growing up in a world where lots of like the major powers in the world that are that you know india and china and uh, sub-Saharan Africa, for example, um, are, are, they're going to have had their own history shaped by colonization and have their own quote, culture wars about empire. Um, and I think helping our students to understand them, we're not really helping our students to understand how a, a, somebody, a, someone of Indian heritage or someone who grew up in India might feel about Britain in the world if we're just teaching them a history of which they that for the purpose of them being proud of it uh, there was a, a news article i can't remember the, i think there was a museum in in kolkata where they put robert clive in a in a, a mirrored yeah. uh, statue of, and like that's really interesting but like the really interesting thing is that that, that was as part of an exhibition about um subras chanda bose who encouraged indians to fight for the japanese and the nazis against the british in the second world war it's like that should be the thing that our students are trying to understand why indians now in the 21st century think that that's a thing to be celebrated in a major museum exhibit rather than like potentially our own hang-ups about clive so i think encouraging students to see the history of the empire as something that's like a global phenomenon and continues to be global rather than just is britain good or bad is like that's our purpose as history teachers, I think. I'm going to go to fund me and then I'm going to go to the last question because I'm really, apologies both, I'm really conscious that we're running out of time. Fund me. Um, I guess as well, there's something in, in terms of wanting to reinforce the values that we, well, British values today, there is something in kind of looking at the actions that were taken in the past and kind of confronting those against what we do see as British values now and kind of questioning like, how does this undermine our current vision of tolerance and how does this kind of represent this idea of discrimination? These are all things that in British values we challenge and in the past what's happened isn't doesn't kind of replicate that. And that could be a good way of teaching it to students because they can compare what happened before to what we are kind of saying are our values today. One last question, and I think it's a cracker because it's one that has plagued, uh, or at least we've really undenied about this a lot. Uh, when I first started teaching, I got some feedback that I was too influenced by my own politics. How do you approach the current political environment when teaching empire? We've all talked about this a lot. Uh, David, I'm going to go to you. How do you how do you mar the, how do you marry those two things? We can't obviously be political in the classroom, but how do you kind of manage that? It's a difficult thing to manage. How do you do it? Yeah, I guess there's um, this is perhaps a slight cop out, but I would say it's a it's a, it's a process of managing tensions, um, and I think unavoidably it's going to be complex. I would say first of all, I would say the answers have pretty much been contained in things people have already said. So first of all, with real attention and respect for our young people and how they are thinking about the world and respect for the fact that they will be encountering family histories, they'll be encountering representations in the media, they'll be encountering these debates. And therefore, we need to kind of be attuned and aware of that and, and be respectful of that. And secondly, I think also to echo Ed, the, the imperative is, is, is a historical imperative. It's an imperative to help students understand the past. Um, and that's at the core of of what we should be trying to do 
and I think that that for me is kind of my guiding star and then with it if we think about conceptual choices there we can think about things like sig significance we can think about things like historical interpretations that allow us to kind of engage with some of these issues but in a way that kind of has a has a rich history and a rich thought in the community and allows kind of access to some of that thinking and that wrestling without perhaps um being colored in, in the problematic way that's kind of uh, discussed in the question i would say thank you very much all uh, i'm really sorry we've run out of time uh, it was a real pleasure to have everybody here this evening and uh, I just really want to end on saying thank you very much for spending. I know this has been an incredibly long term and it's really nice that there are so many people here to come and listen to us, have a chat about a project that we are so enthusiastic and so keen about. Uh, it is so exciting that our book, which Sal has now got well done again, let's so on brand, uh, is out on Friday. And we would really, really strongly encourage you, please, to buy a copy. And in fact, if you can, buy some classroom sets as well. We genuinely think this will be a really useful resource for your Key Stage 3. And I hope that it was interesting this evening uh, listening to us which are on about a topic that we are all far too excited about. So um, thank you very much.